Good afternoon, and, and um, thank you for the invitation to speak, and thank you all for staying. I can't be as quick as Jonathan, uh, but I have given this talk seven times over the last month, ranging from 40 minutes to three minutes. So I'll try and do it in when it comes up in under 10 minutes, if I can. Uh, Endangered archaeology in the Middle East and North Africa should be coming on the screens any minute now. Um, and you can use whatever acronym you like. We just came up with EMINA because it's Endangered Archaeology in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, that works for us. It covers 20 countries from Mauritania to Iran. It's based at the University of Oxford with a member of staff in Leicester and funded by the Arcadia Foundation. We have just about completed our first year. We've got another year's money and we have our fingers crossed for further funding in the future. Um, given the shortage of time, I'm going to flick through the next few slides, not because they're not interesting or I wouldn't like to talk about them, but because there isn't time. That's Persepolis from the air, but never mind. Um, we are on a voyage of discovery, and uh, the project grew out of some work that we'd done in, the aerial, arche in aerial archaeology in Jordan. Um, I, too, forgot to bring a copy of the book to sell there. It's not a tourist book, but anyway, we could have sold it, Ancient Jordan from the Air. If you haven't got a copy, you need to get a copy, uh, but also have a look at the website, 90,000 photographs on the Apami website. Um, the key thing to say is that we're on a voyage of discovery documenting damage and destruction in the Middle East and North Africa, and that can be damage and destruction by any means. Probably the most important agent of destruction is agricultural intensification. And the reason for that is population increase. And what you're looking at on the screen now are the 94,000 records that the team have created uh, since January 2015 across the countries we've worked in so far. It's a rapid overview. So we've worked in 10 of the 20 countries. We hope to get into the other 10 countries during 2016 but we also hope, as I said, for further funding in future to carry on. There's the team at work in Oxford. Somebody referred to it as a research laboratory. That's a nice way of putting it, but it's an office with computers and people in it, so it's a research laboratory. Um, we're using an Arches database, uh, which, is, which has been designed specifically to make records of uh, heritage objects. If it's been it, it developed out of Mega Jordan, and Mega stands for the Middle Eastern Geospatial Antiquities, and the dash Jordan means for Jordan. We're covering the whole of the Middle East and North Africa, but do have a look at the Jordan uh, database as well. Uh, very rapidly, I'll just nip through a few countries uh, just to show the sorts of uh, archaeology that are there and the kinds of destruction. Uh, so Jordan first, and these are just some air photographs we took in uh, this one in 1998 and the archaeological site, there is a pointer on here uh, that I want you to focus on is this one. Uh, you'll see this reservoir on the next slide, um, but what you won't see on the next slide is the archaeological site that was there, completely bulldozed away for agricultural improvement in the space of 12 months. And that was a protected archaeological site under uh, Jordanian antiquities law. I just wanted to show this slide to show the pace of change and the kind of change that's going on. Uh, this is a photograph from the 1930s, the Roman city of Jerash. And then when you look at it today using satellite imagery, you can see the huge build-up around it. Um, and that's all happened in the space of 10 years. Uh, rapid population growth. Um, we're working with the, the local authorities to try and target our work so that if we know there are infrastructure projects, we can work with them. and. Um, uh, two of our team, Rebecca Banks and Dr. Andrea Zabini, and Andrea's here with us, uh, did this rapid survey of the Madaba Ring Road. The Jordanians are going to build a ring road around Madaba. Uh, they told us about it because we asked them, and fortunately we were able to do a survey, found 141 sites, Andrea, 11 of which are going to be affected by the road. Um, and they're now looking at that on the ground. So it's working with the local authorities, and that's already been mentioned. I won't mention Apamea, Ap and I won't mention Palmyra, but I do want to mention Jury Europus. Um, that's a photograph uh, from 28th of December 2011, and this, in a way, summarizes almost everything we've been talking about today, because that's the same site on the 2nd of April 2014. And probably of all the archaeological sites that we've looked at, this is the one where the, the, the scale of the looting, if we just go back to that image, it used to be the case that the biggest threat to archaeological sites were archaeologists, Satanists, as we've been told today. Uh, but actually now, 
It's the looting. Every hole that you can see in there is a looting pit. It goes beyond the outsides of the, of the city. And each of those pits, we've heard from um, Syrian archaeologists who've been there or visited or had re reported, they are two meters by three meters, and they go all the way down to bedrock. It's not surface. This is complete. So uh, that, I think, is the bleeding heart of Syria. Um, Iraq, I just put this one on, and thank you to Paul Collins of the Ashmole Museum for this, which summarizes, in a sense, two things. One is the resilience of archaeology. This is Tel Ubaid, a very, very important site. Um, and what he told me was that what we're looking at on that site uh, are these huge, great gouges here built to hide um, Iraqi tanks because they thought they were going to be invaded from Iran in the 1980s, and Tel Ubaid was a very good place, A, to try and defend it, and B, to hide your tanks. Not very good for the archaeology. But even so, there's still some archaeology left. Um, I just wanted to show two images of Hatra very quickly. This, um, also to make the point that we are using historical air photography, this is from the Oral Stein collection in the British Academy, uh, 1930s mosaic, and then this is an image of Hatra, after ISIS had visited, so I don't want to zoom in in too much detail, um, but there's no doubt that destruction has taken place, but the other thing about Hatter is we do hear reports in the press that it has been totally destroyed. According to this satellite image in April 2015, it hasn't been totally destroyed, thankfully. That's not to diminish what has happened there, but um, as we were saying earlier with the journalists, it is important to get as much evidence as possible. I won't, haven't time to go into Saudi Arabia except to say an amazing uh, range of archaeology that's very well preserved, but even in Saudi Arabia, under threat. Uh, Yemen we've talked about and we heard about uh, earlier in the day, and I'll just go very quickly to, there's looting there on that site, but to this one just to reinforce what we already heard about the citadel um, of, in, in uh, Taiz. And here it is in 2003 and then restoration to try and make it accessible and a place that people can enjoy. So full restoration in 2014. And then you saw the images from the ground, but those are the craters that you can see from uh, the aerial bombardment that took place. And I think you said three or five bombs or however many bombs hit it. Um, so what more can we as archeologists do in the current situation? Um, there was a summit in Washington last week um, where there was an outbreak of peace and harmony amongst American archaeologists. Um, I never even thought there wasn't, a, there was always peace and harmony with American archaeologists. But the key thing was that actually cooperation and collaboration in terms of, there's a huge area to, be, to look at, there's plenty of room for everybody, and we want to make sure that we're not all tripping up over each other. So actually we've avoided doing too much work in Syria and Iraq because uh, particularly ACE or the American Schools of Oriental Research have done a lot of work in Syria and Iraq. But the last point there, it's very, very important to do the monitoring on the ground, in the country, wherever possible. And that's definitely something that we're doing with, our with the information we've got. Once we've created enough um, evidence from the satellite imagery and understanding what archaeology we've got and where the threats are, we can work with people on the ground. And the team from Leicester have just got, come back from um, a fieldwork expedition in Morocco where on the, on the site that they were working at they discovered that the, the local people were building a sign and the sign said in Arabic God, King and Country and they were using the archaeological stones to help build this sign. So the director of antiquities who visited with them said can you stop doing that please and they said but we've been told to do it by the governor. Um, and so there's a, they did stop doing it, so they went down the hill and got stones from prehistoric cairns, and they said, no, no, don't take the stones from the prehistoric cairns, go somewhere else. So, um, the, but they're still going to build their sign. Uh, so what can we do? I think training, as Jonathan's already said, training is very, very important. We've run a few um, aerial archaeology training schools. schools. We're now going to do uh, more workshops, and the next one's planned for Iraq in September under the banner of the Protecting the Past series. Um, and here we are, it's just embarrassing people to give them stereoscopic images so they can see the archaeology in stereo. Um, but also the local community we've already heard today is key. This is just an example, one example in Jordan, uh, a site called Um El Jamal, and there's Bert de Vries who has spent 46 years. Um, you have to be in it for the long haul when you want to do uh, cultural heritage preservation 
and uh, Bert's been a great example. If you haven't looked at the website of Um El Jamal, I recommend it. And they've deliberately made it one of the best websites of any archaeological site, certainly in Jordan, if not the whole of the Middle East, if not the world, because they realize not many people are going to visit. Um, I haven't time to go into that. Any questions? There we are. Thank you very much. Thank you.